healing is possible. We share stories of people everywhere who have healed from their diagnoses. Powered by healthrevolution.org. I'm your host, Dr. Anup Kumar. Another thing that did come to mind is, as far as a healing that was, I'm happy to share it or not. I'll, I'll go whatever direction you want me to go. Yeah. But it is one where I discovered, surprisingly for me, one where what was thought of as healthy eating, I was suffering inexplicable depression hmm. while eating, while doing the what would be thought of by most people as healthy eating. And I had to figure out what was going on there, change things, and was able to just alleviate that. Um, and I kept testing it and testing it because I'm like, it can't be right. That can't be true. Yeah. You know, so I went back to the old way and I depressed again and go back to this, you know, to the, the real food way and it would alleviate. Yeah. And I'm like, it can't be it. I must have just had a good day. Maybe the wife was nicer to me today. Yeah. I don't know. You know, who knows? Yeah. And then yeah. back to the healthy, you know, processed yeah. food, depression. Yeah. I like, I like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, it, but it wasn't, it was true. So let's get into that. I mean, I want to talk about your, your professional expertise as well. And, and let's start here since you started it. What yeah. is, what is your take on the association between, uh, let's say food and mental health based on your experience and your work with your clients? Yeah, it's, it's huge. You know, every single week, you know, I, I keep my nose in published peer reviewed research every single week. And I'm always looking at, of course, like, like many of us, I've got certain keywords triggered so that PubMed is going to send me various alerts on various topics. One of them is ultra processed food and mental health. Mm -hmm. And every single month there's research coming out and I can almost say it's so rare to be able to say this. I can almost say that uniformly across the board, there isn't a single thing good if ultra processed food intake is high with regard to mental health nothing it's always negative it's just to what degree is it negative yeah everything from anxiety depression dementia cognition they've shown iq is lower in in people who who consume the highest amounts of ultra processed food um the ability of the frontal lobe to execute executive function rational decisions is diminished in people who consume a lot of ultra processed foods. So sharpness goes down and then all the other elements I mentioned goes down um, as ultra processed consumption goes up. Yeah. Not a thing good about it. Not yeah. one thing. And, yeah. and, and when you go the other way, they see dramatic improvements in all of those same elements. Yeah. Uh, the more real food people eat, yeah. the less depression, the less dementia, the less anxiety the, and all, and all of that. So, I'm more of a, I'm not a neurologist. You know, I have the good basic understanding of, of, of neurotransmitters and this kind of thing. But so I, I, in my view, I keep it as a health coach, more macro, you know, mm -hmm. um, and just kind of big picture. I don't try to get into, I also, I'm not a reductionist. So I don't like to look at, well, caramel color is a problem. Mm -hmm. Look, if it's ultra processed, we don't need right. to look any further. Right. And we, and I found for myself, initially, I tried to pinpoint the chemical that was causing my depression. Yeah. And I thought, maybe I'm, maybe I'm gluten intolerant. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go gluten-free for a bit. Yeah. Well, I was still eating ultra-processed foods that were gluten-free. Yeah, right. And what a surprise. Yeah. My depression did not go away. Yeah. And I thought, you're not going to be able to do this onesie twosie, Dave. Yeah. You're going to have to just say, all of this is garbage. Yeah. And it is. Yeah. And just go real food 90% of the time. Yeah. When you do that, you feel good. Your energy's good. You're sharp. Um, you're not in a bad mood. You're not uh, tired, yeah. you know, tired. Not and, to mention all the uh, physical conditions, not just mental conditions, but oh, physical conditions. I mean, cardiovascular God, every joint in my body, autoimmune conditions, everything. Yeah. yeah. Every, I, I kid you not. I'd go into the gym and I'd be like, how old am I? You know, I was maybe, you know, whatever. I was like late forties then, you know, when I figured this out yeah. and I was like, I I've got to warm up for like 30 minutes. Every joint in my body is like on fire. Yeah. And again, the depression, what's going on anyway, of course, 
with the real food. Now my joints are normal. They're good. Yeah. Um, again, the mental side, it's just really, really fantastic. And here's the thing for me. It's just the way I'm wired. I didn't know. I really didn't know. I don't get me wrong. I was eating, I call it more the, it was more the whole wheat, low fat, you know, kind of stuff, you know, yeah. it was like, yeah. in, but it was still ultra processed yeah. stuff, you know, yeah. um, with all the other stuff in there. And uh, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. And so I thought, am I going to have to get this quote unquote crazy? Or you yeah. think about it, you go crazy. This is how we ate for hundreds of thousands of years. Right. Right. You know, I mean, it's only I mean, the last. You know, the other way to think about it is like food versus not food. Yes. Really? I mean, it's, right. you're eating real food or you're not eating real food. It's yes. Like ultra processed is, is just like a, it's an adjective, but it's not really like original food is the simple part of it. It really is. And, yeah. and in my head, once I switched and flipped and, you know, of course, the more I've looked at ultra processed food and, and gotten a, I have an adaptation that I use for as a definition of real food that I adapted from, uh, the Nova food classification system. Have you heard of Nova? No, I haven't. Nova was developed by a professor um, in Brazil about 10, 12 years ago. It's one of a few food classification systems that are out there. Um, it's not perfect, but in my view, based on all that I've looked at with all the systems that define kind of food and what's quote healthy and unhealthy, mm -hmm. I like that system the best, mm -hmm. Nova. Mm -hmm. And then I've adapted a working definition from that just to make it so that I can say it without having to get into seven paragraphs of nuance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I go, when, you know, with us at Linus Lifestyle University, our objective is to move more toward that. Yeah. What's happened over 50, 50 or so years is, you know, in the United States, we're sitting at 43% obesity right now. In 1970, we were at 15%. In 2030, we're supposed to be 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on? And so what's happened is a part of what's happened is ultra processed food has crowded out real food. 60 to 90% of what adults consume in the United States is ultra processed food. Research mm -hmm. bears that out. Add boots on the ground, real world eyes on clients and this kind of thing. And it easily hits 90%, you know? Yeah. So it, one objective of a few is to progressively without overwhelming, not take away, but add in more real food. Happy to give the definition if you want a uh, mine, yeah, um, add in more real food so that we start, we start crowding out the ultra process. Yeah. And it seems crazy to people like we were just saying, they go, wow, you know, how can anybody do this? Yeah. Well, we all did. Yeah. Right. For hundreds of thousands of years. Right. Well, it's yeah. like the idea of nowadays, like it, it, I think it's easy for kids. If you're not living in, in the countryside, it's easy for kids to not really know where food comes from because it comes right. from the shelf, right? Yes. It comes from the grocery store. Exactly. Um, and unless you lived on a farm or, or are in the country, it, I think it's, you might not see fresh fruits and vegetables. Like it, right. it's a lot of boxes. So that's right. Um, and so even, even the idea that something's being crowded out doesn't even compute. It doesn't make sense because there's no right. other knowledge. Yeah. Um, so, and that's why it seems so strange. Um, one of the, one of the guests I had on was Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, um, who's a surgeon who advocates a plant-based lifestyle and has helped tons of people heal from heart disease, reverse heart disease, which was yeah. thought to be impossible. Yeah. No, no stent, no cardiac bypass food, reversed heart disease. And people would say, well, you know, wow, really like none of that food and just plant-based and like, that's, that's pretty extreme. Yeah. And, and nobody stops to think that putting a saw through your chest to open it up. I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't think of anything more extreme, but like simply literally changing what you're putting in your mouth is considered so wild. I know. I think that's the effectiveness of the marketing, you know, it is of the, of the culture. There's so many obesogenic factors. A number of them are related to profit, profit driven motives that, that impact advertising, marketing, um, what's available, uh, the number of fast food restaurants, convenience stores, 24 yeah. seven, uh, the, the ultra processed foods are cheap. They're quick. They yeah. require very little, uh, preparation yeah. or, or none. Yeah. And all of that is very seductive, attractive to parts of our brains 
that are about conservation of energy and convenience and saving time and quote betterment it's better because it saves us you know but there's a really it's just really it's really confusing uh, to people and one of the things is is that there's an addictive property to ultra processed food that people don't appreciate yes absolutely um i want to get your take especially being a health coach for decades and and um i feel like we see things similarly so i really want to get your take on this and that is um, willpower, starting something, you know, we, I told you, we recently did the health jumpstart program. We're starting that now. And what I find is a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I kind of know this stuff. And what I always say is like, knowing is not enough, yeah. you know, that like knowing is not enough. And, uh, I think you would agree that it's actually like a, a few key changes that you make that are not complex. I, I totally agree with what you said that there's no need to get into the weeds for most of this stuff. It's like, look, it's, it's a, a few basic principles, do them consistently, and they're incredibly powerful. Like over months to years are incredibly powerful. So can you speak to that? Like, I mean, one, one we all know there's kind of this idea for like something fancy and something complex and, and glitzy. We know about that. Let's leave that aside. But how do you how do you help your clients to start to get over that initial inertia to go from zero to wherever that is, and then to sustain? Because um, you've had to do that. You've helped many people do that. What's your take on that? So, you know, the way you described, you know, the people that had just done your, your, your newest program is something the way I, I describe it as so many people come to me with it. I know what to do. I just need to do it. Right. They've got yeah. a certain mindset. And when they're, yeah. when they say that, I know what to do. I just need to do it. They may not exactly say that, but that's what they're saying. Yeah. When they say that, they're referring specifically to the nutrition and exercise in and out component. Calories in, calories out. I know I'm supposed to eat healthier. A lot of them are confused about what that means, but they think they know. Yeah. And that can be a detriment by yeah. them not knowing what they don't know. Yeah. And okay. a part, and it's not their fault because they've been misinformed, um, misguided, outright lied to. The yeah. health weight management industry is wrought yeah. with scam and wrought with misinformation and disinformation and, and, and all of the above. Um, so it's not a wonder that they're confused, but think they know, mm -hmm. right? So the, I, I know what to do. I just need to do it relates to the inputs and outputs, calories in, calories out, nutrition and exercise. And it's like, doc, just help me stick to the healthy eating a little bit better. And I, I got it. I don't yeah. need anything else. Yeah. That's, so first of all, one of the things that, that we do is we have to look at what do they really know about nutrition and how can we help them move more toward real food, you know, and educate them on why that really matters. What does that really impact and who cares? Mm -hmm. Because the other thing is that they a lot of times come to you or I with, with a message that's been preached to them from dietetics and everybody else. It's a moderation in all things. Mm -hmm. Moderation in all things, including moderation. Yeah. Sometimes, depending on the person and the situation and the time of day and the instance and the trigger and the ultra processed food and a number of other things, sometimes zero is better than one. So they come in with this. I know what to do. I just need to do it. Calories in, calories out. Eat less, exercise more. But we've got to take it. What we've got to do first is we've got to get them good nutrition information that's really solid and factual and evidence-based. That's simple and easily easy to digest, no pun intended, but it's easy for them to digest the information. Exercise, figure out where they are, meet them where they are. Some people are avid exercisers. Great. Sometimes it's just keep doing what you're doing, rock and roll. And for some people, they don't know much or they're very deconditioned and we've just got to get them start moving, you know, figure out what they can do. Their body can be their gym. They don't need fancy equipment. If they don't, if they go to a whole, uh, a gym, if they like group classes, if they like personal trainers, great. Not necessary at all. We meet their meet them where they are, no matter what they've got going on for a mobility issue or pain. We can, in concert with their medical treatment, whatever's going on, we can make it work. There's a way. There's always a way, is what I say. All right. Let's assume that we've got that nutrition and the exercise pretty squared away. Mm -hmm. From a law of thermodynamics, calories in, calories out, you know, total daily energy expenditure, the math on paper, we can calculate pretty closely within a few hundred calories 
what they're going to need to gain, stay the same or lose. And how mm -hmm. much do you want to lose a pound a week? You know, what do you want to do? We can map that out. And on paper, we can get that pretty dialed in and pretty, pretty accurate, reasonably accurate for what will happen if they're able to do it. Mm -hmm. So kind of right off the bat, I say, you don't really know what to do. So you really can't do it. So let's make sure you do know what to do. Okay. But that's the mechanical stuff. I call that the mechanical stuff. Once they've got that, then we go, what's going to keep that going in the right direction? If that goes off the rails, if that nutrition and exercise energy expenditure bus goes in the ditch, it always goes in the ditch based on my decades of experience, based on what I've seen with clients and based on what I've seen, limited research because the research is behind. But I see it, I see three major areas and they aren't single factors, these areas, but there's three major areas that need to be considered for the person to be ultimately successful. And that is their willpower is driven by why power. Okay, it just is. For every doc, you went to medical school hard. That is not easy. The things you do each day, hard. The education, the training, residency, on and on and on. Anybody who's done anything hard that took a long time, your why for doing the things that needed to be done, which I'll, the definite my definition of willpower is doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. Hmm. That's just my working definition. Mm -hmm. Your why was so strong that you said, I will do this. I will do this work. I will lose sleep if I have to. I will, whatever it is, whatever the suff not the suffering, whatever the sacrifices were, I will do that. Anybody who's accomplished anything, I don't care if it's a stay-at-home mom who's raising kids. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a professional, if it's a degree, if it's a vocation. I don't care. Whatever you've done, you've done things that are hard. And every time you've done those things that take a long time, your why was incredibly strong, whether you think so or not. And people have willpower. Let me give an example. Ask somebody, when was the last time you were late for work? Most people are going to be like, Man, never? I mean, like once a year? I mean, it's really rare. I find my clients generally, it's really rare. Why? Because you're always in a good mood? You, you go to work every time. You're always in a good mood. You've always got lots of energy. You didn't just have three hours of sleep because the kids kept you up all night. You, you weren't sick. You didn't, you know, all these things, but you did it. Why'd you do it? Why did you do that thing that requires willpower to get there and be there on time? Because the why for maintaining that career, position, job, whatever, and all the things that it gives beyond money and beyond were worth it. So worth it that I'll go there sick, tired, mad, after just having an argument with a spouse, I'll go in, I'll do it. Same thing you could say is if you've got kids of school age, you can ask the question, when's the last time you had a kid that needed, a child of yours that needed to be picked up at school, soccer practice or school or whatever, and you just went, eh, nah, <laughs> ever. Yeah. You know, we yeah. beat ourselves up for five years as a parent for 10 minutes late at some point. You know, I mean, it's like, yeah. oh, my gosh, I was 10 minutes late. You know, we can't bear the thought of what that cost would be. So our why for making sure we're there for our children in all the ways that da, 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 is incredibly strong. And again, let's face it, as parents, my kids are all grown and in, in, in adults now living on their own. But as parents, you just you're going to do it because it's your why is so strong. It's just they're that important and, and all factors that go into it. It's the same thing here. It's just that in weight management, people, you know, started coming to me in 1998 when the internet first came on and they started emailing me and it was, and there's a very similar sentiment now where it's, Hey Dave, uh, you know, when you get a chance real quick, uh, on email real quick, no big deal. Just, you know, take a couple minutes of your time. I don't want to, I don't want to burden you. If you could just tell me how I can lose and keep off forever 30 pounds, you know, um, just, you know, when you get a moment, just, I don't want to, it's, it's really minimized yeah. what we're talking about doing. Yeah. And when we look at all of the obesogenic factors in our society and ultra processed food and advertising and marketing and availability and 24 seven and cheap and, and all those society and all the social factors that contribute to it and all the internal factors and all the other external factors, we're not asking for a small thing here. So the why can't be small. You can't say, hey, I'm going to ask you, why do you want to lose these 30 pounds? And they go, I just, you know, I just want to feel a little better. 
I'm sorry. That's not enough. And so beyond nutrition and exercise, we've got to, every time we've got willpower that's lasting, it's why power driving it. So why power drives willpower? And that's missed almost entirely. Some people may hit it surface level. We want to drill down and squeeze and wring out every single drop of why that we can, because it's going to be necessary because it's the thing that's going to have you get up at 5 a.m. if necessary to get in a half hour workout. Or it's the thing that's going to have you on a Sunday for an hour or two prepping meals for the week so that you're prepared, ready to go, save yourself time later, whatever it may be. That why is the thing that'll keep you going when life has other plans. Okay. Are you still with me? So that's, that's one hundred percent. I mean, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. So keep going. Yep. So that's one of three of the majors and there's okay. multiple little splinter things on why. All right. The other thing is I've mentioned it is if your why is like with my backstory, my why I said was crazy strong. I didn't have the right modality. I didn't have the right treatment. My why kept me going to find it. It was so strong that even though I was not winning, I was not gaining on reduction of pain and increased mobility. I was like, I have to keep going. I, I just can't stop. I can't give up because my why was so strong. I was doing the wrong things. Didn't know I was lost. You know, I didn't know what to do, but I kept going because of the why. It's the same thing. Even if you're doing the wrong things nutritionally, you're doing the wrong things. Your why will help, and you're going, man, I'm not getting, I'm not losing any weight. I'm not getting where I want to be. Your why will keep you figuring it out. Find the person that isn't giving you the wrong message, that isn't giving you the wrong plan, that isn't the wrong support network, so on and so forth until you find, all right, let's say we, so we've got the why. If we're not at least considering ultra processed food addiction, we're sunk. Your why can be strong, but if that ultra process, if there is an addiction there and we don't address it, it will not relent. It will be there and it will be a trouble spot. It will be a, sabot a saboteur. It will be the thing that keeps the person from doing the nutrition and exercise components consistently. There will always be something unless that's addressed. And that's a very complex thing, but it can be simplified. There is a process to it. It's not so complex that we can't make it, again, palatable. Mm -hmm. But we've got to address that. So that's number two. Number three is this really multifaceted area, which um, I, I know you're familiar with as well. I refer to it as emotional fitness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all manner of things that help us to feel authentically good. And I use that word authentically on purpose, authentically good more often mm -hmm. to be better life managers, to be able to make the better choice between the stimulus and our response. Whatever the stimulus would be, argument, happy thing, sad thing, stressful thing, anxiety thing, where normally it's gotten to the point where it's a conditioned automated response. It's like Pavlov's dog, ring the bell and they salivate. This conditioned automated response can be like this. And it's eat, boom. I This occurs in my life, I go to alcohol. This occurs in my life, I go to ultra processed food and it's that fast and there's no gap. There's no space. There's no time to just process it just a little bit, bring the temperature down, come at it. Not so catastrophic, come at it more measured. And that can be taught. You are, people are not destined like eye color to always respond to X, Y, Z event stimulus with ABC response. It doesn't have to be that way. And I remember probably 25 or so years ago, the first time I heard someone say, you choose your response. I went, what are you talking about? I really did. Mm -hmm. I was like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? I choose? No, X, Y, Z event occurs. Of course you, anybody just responds this way. Mm -hmm. And of course, wasn't true. I was just younger and ignorant. Mm -hmm. So we all have the ability between the stimulus and the response to make that choice. But to be able to do that, we've got to grow personally. 
We've got to grow our level of emotional fitness. And again, like so many other things, everybody comes to me at a different level of emotional fitness. Some are quite developed and that's not the issue. You know, some just need little tweaks. It's just little refinements, you know, where we're going to focus on maybe just getting a little more sleep, you know, making sure that's sitting at least seven hours a day, most days of the week, so on and so forth. The rest of the stuff they're, they're, they're doing that's just good, basic, you know, emotional fitness, you know, type work. Mm -hmm. um, and some don't have a, any concept of what it is. And as a child, they were never told anything about it. Most of us weren't really, yeah. yeah. you know, um, follow the golden rule, son. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I was taught to be a good person and try to be kind to others, Yeah, but I wasn't taught the elements that really go into it. I, I had to work on it. I had to develop, I had to learn them and then, you know, try to, try to practice them. And I'm always a, uh, you know, I'm always, I'm always learning and evolving. I definitely don't have it all figured out. That's for sure. But I am so much better because of this. And my clients are so much better because they can, they can pause. They can pause instead of it being like that. It's like stimulus, boom, light switch. This is what I do. It can be like, wait a minute. And sometimes that five seconds, three seconds, 10 seconds can be just enough where they go, bring it down, bring it down. You know, we don't have to say awful, horrible, terrible nightmare. We don't have to use catastrophics and absolutes, always, never, forever, things like that that are almost always wrong. We can change our self-talk. We can, we, can, we can do all of these things and we can make the better choice. So if we've got nutrition and exercise understood, good evidence-based foundation there, a good framework that's adaptable. Mm -hmm. It's those three areas that I talked about that for each person are best if they are adapted to where they are and what the next step is in their journey for growing those areas. Sometimes we do it simultaneously. Why? We're looking at addiction. We're looking at emotional fitness, but just a little piece of each. And sometimes we're like, look, the first thing we need to do is we're going to hit the why, because I see that being the da 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 da. Um, right now, it's not right now. You are underappreciating what it's going to take in our obesogenic environment to do what you want to do. You've got this, eh, eh, yeah, and that isn't going to work. It's it's minimized too much, yeah. And um, but it can be one. And that's the thing that that's why I'm super encouraged by it. When we really do come at it from this holistic, comprehensive way, make it uh, meet them where they are, take them. I, I, I say this, and it's funny that, you know, I'm obviously talking to a medical doctor here, but I, I use this example. So I don't know if you'll agree. Um, mm -hmm. I'll be interested to see what your perspective is. Sure. So I say, look, in medicine, thankfully, we all have a heart generally located in our chest cavity. We have a couple of kidneys, we have a liver, we've got a pancreas, we've got pieces and parts generally in the similar place and they generally function similarly. And there's enough similarities between us all where we don't walk into a doctor's office and they go, wow, you are an enigma. I have no idea, you know, uh, what are, what species are you? No, they know, but that doesn't mean that every treatment is going to be the same because it just won't be. There's 10 different pain relievers out there and that's for a reason. Some people are responsive to this. Some people are responsive to that. I said, but fortunately, we are similar enough where there's a framework where at least the medical doctors have a framework to start with. Yeah. They say, I know these organs do this. I know, yeah. you know, this, you know, all the, the various systems in the body and the interaction. And, and it's that way in health coaching. It's like when you come to me, I know that we need to look at the why. We need to address the nutrition and exercise kind of up front because people are so eager up front to just tell me what to eat and what do I, you know, uh, but I know we've got to address the why we're going to ask and ask questions and try to figure out if there is something that might be compulsive uh, re regarding processed food addiction. If so. Okay. And then we're going to look at emotional fitness and kind of just see like, where's, how are they responding to life? How are they, what's going on? Um, what are their trigger situations? What are their, you know, uh, on and on and on. How can we help them better reevaluate those situations so it's not so instantaneous? So luckily, there's there's enough similarities with us all, so we have a framework. Yeah. But the differences require uniqueness to a degree. Yeah. In approach. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. I think that's a great uh, analogy how you talk about it is that we have a model of anatomy and you can take that model of anatomy and you can superimpose it on anybody. And at least from a bodily perspective, it's going to be accurate enough in most cases. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things I talk about is something else, which is like, if you go to different cultures, they actually have different models of anatomy. In yoga, the model of anatomy is different. In Chinese medicine, it's a different model of anatomy. So we still have some work to do in medicine because we, we can't, it almost looks like a different species to us. So we have to, we have to work on that. Um, but I agree with you 100% that we can say the physiology is different, but the anatomy is pretty much the same from a bodily perspective. And so that's where we, that's where we tweak things and how, how the treatments that we administer might work. The physiology might be a little bit different in one than the other. And, and we tweak that. Um, and everything you're saying also resonates with what we're doing, you know, with our course in the sense that we feel like fundamentals are fundamental. You cannot yeah. avoid fundamentals for right. something fancy. You know, right. I, I, I'm all for, I see so many things about microbiome testing and uh, ancestry and genetics and all this stuff. And great. If we want, people want yeah. to do that, great. But none of it means that you can skip the fundamentals. Right. Right. That nobody has the genes to skip the fundamentals. Everybody's right. got to breathe. Everybody's got to eat food, yeah. right. like real food. You know, everybody needs fresh air, like connection with others. I mean, yes. these are, these are, this is human nature. This is human sustenance. And so, um, yeah, part of the, the way we tie in um, the emotion is actually our second module is called movement. And so that includes movement of the body. It includes movement of our emotions, you know, stagnated emotions. Um, it includes movement of our creativity. Like, what do I love doing? Yeah. You know, what to kind of speaking to that? Why? Like, like, why do I get up in the morning? You know, it's, it's, it's so important. So um, it's, it's been a wonderful wide ranging conversation with you, Dave, uh, David, I know, I know you've been doing this for decades and I appreciate you coming on and sharing your experience with us. Uh, the name of the show is healing is possible. I ask all my guests, this is how we wrap up. When you hear the phrase healing is possible, what does that mean to you? It's I'm optimistic and I, and I, and I'm in agreement. You know, I, 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 like you said, you agree with a number of the points that I made. I fully agree with um, how it is so underappreciated and underestimated, just how amazing the body is when we give it what it needs, how it can heal. It's amazing what it will do for us when we take care of it in the way that it needs to be taken care of. Um, that's that's what that's how it strikes me. It's it it's it's optimistic and it's realistic beyond like you said what people realize. The stories shared here are the experiences of the speakers. They're not intended as medical advice. Join our network or simply share your story at healthrevolution.org. Healing is possible.